Today's message is all about watch your mouth. It's about how your words shape your faith, how your words impact people. How do you get your words in the right place so you can build strong relationships at work, at home? Listen, tune in today. I hope it blesses your life. Praise God in this house. Anybody need the Lord's grace in your life? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Father, we come to you right now and we declare we need your grace. We declare that we cannot make it without you. We declare that you are the health and strength. You are everything that we have. So, Father, we just thank you, God. It was grace that woke us up this morning. It was grace that got us started. It was grace that has given us the activity of our limbs. It was grace that paid our bills. It was grace that got us through school. It was grace that allowed us to retire. It was grace that has kept us all these years. It was grace that has given us a chance to worship your name. It was grace that allowed us to have a relationship with you when you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. As a matter of fact, we were disqualified. But by your grace, you sent a son that would die on our behalf. And we say thank you. It's by grace that we're saved. And not of works meets any man boast. So, Father, we say thank you that we are living on grace. Grace woke us up. Grace strengthens us. And grace will get us through tomorrow. We honor your name. We thank you for this next generation singing songs of praise you. We thank you, Lord. This is what Big Mama prayed for. This is what Grandma, this is what Grandpa said I wanted to see. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we are living on the prayers, on the seeds planted generations ago. We love you and we honor you and we praise your name. It's in your son Jesus' name that we say this prayer and all of God's people said amen. Come on, let's celebrate today. Come on, celebrate these young people as they return back. Come on, let's celebrate them, celebrate them, celebrate them. Amen, amen, amen. We thank God that we are a church of many generations. And we thank God for these young people just singing their hearts out on today because that's our future, family. That's, that's our future. You, some of you knew what, knew what that was like when your, your Sunday came and you, you got up there and sang, Jesus loves all the little children. You, you got up there and saying, yes. Jesus loved me, and you, you got your little hymn book together, and you were singing that song. But this is the next rendition. They are standing on the shoulders of what we prayed for, what we asked God for. Now they are worshiping and loving God, and we thank God for God, how God is using them. Amen. 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 Family, we are so good to see you on this morning. We thank you for being here on today. I was so glad it rained yesterday and not today because I said, listen, you know how we act when rain show up. So I was like, Lord, thank you for Saturday, not Sunday. So I am so grateful. It mean, it rained all day, all, all day long. And I said, ooh, please. So we are grateful uh, that you are here on this morning. But even in the rain, we were still doing ministry. We fed over 500 seniors came through our drive through fish fry. It, it is the highlight of the year. I want to thank Pastor Williams and his team for the way they served and ministered to so many of our seniors who came out in the inclement weather so we could love on them and bless them with a, with a, uh, with, with a, with a fish plate. Amen. A chicken plate and a fish plate is always in order in the black church. That They are staples. Has to be on the menu. And uh, we are thankful for yesterday. We had a great, great, great time. All right, family. Um, we also are baptizing today. Let me see. I want to make sure I share this with you. We are so excited. I want to make. I want to make sure I miss it. I make sure I got the note here. We we baptized close to thirty people on today. Half this service. <laughs> Woo. Incredible! 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 I don't think they're back in the service yet, but we are so proud of them and so excited for all the decisions God continues to make in life of our church. All right, family, if you got your Bibles, meet me in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we have been making our way through the book of James, and we are about halfway through uh, James chapter 3. I want to read for you, friends, this the first 12 verses of that particular chapter, James chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 12, and it reads this way. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers. Because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways, and anyone who has never at fault of what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. 
When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the horse, we can take, turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire and a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's image. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. Or, or cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Amen, amen, amen. You may take your seats. As you take your seats, would you tell your neighbor good morning next to you? Tell them good morning, tell them good morning. Don't, don't tell them, that's you in the passage, that's you in the passage. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. All right, family. For a few moments, I want to share from the subject of watch your mouth. Watch your, watch your mouth. I started serving on staff when I was 25. It was August of 2020, Pastor Bailey, 2000, that Pastor Bailey, our founding pastor, invited me to join on staff, and I was overjoyed, absolutely, at the privilege to serve on staff. About two years I've served on staff, he then asked me to, uh, to become the uh, ass assistant pastor as well as his successor. Super excited about that opportunity and began serving in that role. And on one occasion, there was a leadership meeting that happened on Saturday. Uh, he said to me, Brian, I need you to uh, ask this individual to come to that meeting uh, because we're announcing their new role. And so uh, I, 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 uh, the meeting came, he wasn't there, and the uh, pastor then asked me, where is he? And, and I said, uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, the, uh, that was part of the, well, he couldn't make it because I never invited him in the first place. And so um, the next day, uh, Sunday, he then came to me and said, uh, Brian, I, I asked him, and he said, you never, um, um, he said, you never invited him to come. Um, and I said, uh, I said, I lied. I apologize. Uh, and he said these words to me. He said, Brian, don't make me have to question your integrity. And uh, after I picked up my face up off the floor, I began to realize something in that moment, that our words matter. I was, I was trying to be impressive. I didn't want to make a mistake. New role, new opportunity, young. And I made the mistake of lying to my boss and subsequently had him help. He held me accountable. And that was a moment when I realized that your words really matter. That all of us know what that's like. We all have had moments where we have had to learn that what you say, what you don't say, how you say it, who you say it to, who you don't say it to, all of those things shape your life. They, they shape our relationships. They, they shape our friendships. They shape our partnerships. They shape, shape our business. They shape a church. They shape a family. They, 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 your words and how we talk to others and how we treat others and how we communicate, they are really the foundation for all of our relationships. Any relationship that is of substance is based on good communication. And so it's no surprise that James, the author of this letter, as he begins to try and capture how we ought to live on our faith more fully, it's no surprise that right in the middle of the letter, he would spend these verses 
12 verses, but he actually uses more verses in the life of the chapter to keep reminding us and to show us that your faith ought to show up in your words. That your words and the words you use and the words you connect and how you talk to people and whether you speak the truth or whether you speak lie, that all of those things shape our faith, that our faith has to flow through our words. And so I hope you're, I hope, I hope today we all lean in to today's passage because there's not a person in this room that can't grow in the area of their communication. Matter of fact, there's no one that ever fully arrives and ever has it all together. All of us have work to do in order to be who God has called us to be in terms of how we talk and connect with others. Here's the first principle out of the text. My words are a measure of my maturity. My words are a measure of my maturity. I want you to catch this, friends, in verses 1 and 2. He literally says this. He says, he says, he says that in verse 2, he says, listen to this. He says, if you can control your words, you can control your whole life. He's trying to help us to understand that, that, that Matthew 5, 15 and 18 says, it's not the things that you put in the mouth, but it's the things that come out of your mouth, that your, your mouth is a reflection of your heart. So if, you can, if we can control our words, then in turn, we can control our entire lives. He said it all starts there. Just like a thermometer tells the temperature of the room, the words that you use, the things you post on social media, the, the, the things you put in text messages, all of those things indicate and shape who you are. Like a car that has a dashboard, he says your words are the dashboard of your life and they indicate where your spiritual life is. Now, can you imagine that the health of your life, like there are dashes, on, there are gauges on the dashboard, there are also gauges on your life. There's a meter that talks about how many lies you told. There's a meter that talks about how much encouragement did you give away. How much criticism did you give? How much gossip did you get engaged in? If you can control your words, you can control your whole life. Here's the next one, friends. Our words are powerful, so be, be, caught, be careful. Our words are power, powerful. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says this, your, your words may seem small, but, but, but they are not insignificant. He says your words are so powerful that they, they are like the small two inches or three inch bit that goes in a horse's mouth but they can control a horse over a 1,000 pounds. That a huge ship has a small rudder, but that rudder shapes the life of that entire ship. And he comes and tells us that your words are so powerful. So he says, be cautious with your words because they're small, but they make a big impact. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. But you and I can't underestimate how significant our words are because the words that we have have a great impact on those around us, either for good or also can be used for bad. Here's the next one, friends. Our words can be destructive, so be constructive. He gets around verses 5 and 6, and he uses the analogy about the tongue. He says it is full of evil. He says it's like a forest fire. That tongue can set a spark and set the whole forest on fire. If you've watched any time over the summer months, often in California, there's always fires that come about. One of them that happened in September 2020 was the consequence of a family having a gender reveal and the spark happened and ended up burning 23,000 acres of land, all from one spark. He says the same thing can happen with my tongue and your tongue. We can say one thing and that one spark can either build something or it can break something. He goes on to say this. Here's the next one, friends. Our words are uncontrollable, so be controlled by the Spirit. You get down to verse 7, and he says it's a restless evil. He says it this way. You've seen all kinds of people train all kinds of animals. Text says you can train animals. You can train birds. You can train reptiles. You can even train sea creatures. But he says that tongue, it can't be trained. That tongue always wants to get into something, wants to start something, wants to say something. 
wants to share what it heard, wants to share what it thought, wants to share its opinion. He puts it this way in verse 8. He says, it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. This, is, this is rough, y'all. This is, this is hard, but he's trying to help us to understand. He says, no man or woman can control the tongue. No matter how hard you try to do it, no matter how much you think you got it under control, he says, no man, no woman is able to control the tongue. That tongue, he said, is so restless, it's so deadly, it can't be controlled by anyone. So what's our hope if we can't control it? What he's trying to help us to understand is that you can't control it in your own strength, but you're going to have to depend on God to be able to give you the strength to be able to control your tongue. He's trying to tell us that tongue can betray us so quickly that it's going to require us leaning on God, leaning on the Holy Spirit. Here it is, Lord, guide my tongue as I go to work on today. Lord, guide my tongue as I have this conversation. Lord, guide my tongue, keep me as I get in the middle of this. Lord, give me the words to say. Give me the right tone to use. Give me, tell me when to stop and not go too far. Tell me how to say, give me the right timing so I find the right time. He's saying, friends, you and I cannot control our tongues and do it on our own. We need God every single day to guide our hearts, to guide our words, and to guide our thoughts. See, the reason you need God is because words are not just words. Words are a reflection of our hearts. Sometimes people that lash out, it ain't even about you. It's not even having anything to do with you. But sometimes people can have stuff in their heart, in their mind, and they just lash out because that's the kind of person or the kind of season they may be going through. So correcting the words ain't always the easy part. Sometimes you got to get to the heart. Why am I so angry? Why am I always frustrated? Why do I always think everybody's against me? Why do I take everything personal? Sometimes you got to have a heart change before you can have your words change. And that's why he's saying you got to ask God to do that. Oh, friends, listen, he's trying to help you to understand only God can turn a cusser into a praiser. Only God can turn a gossip into a good friend. Only God can take a liar and make them a, a friend that you can depend on. Only God can do that. You can't do it in your own strength, your own willpower. You need Jesus' power and Holy Spirit power. You got to be filled with the Holy Spirit so he can can change your tongue, your attitude, and your heart. Only God can do it. He's saying you got to learn how to lean and depend on God. You got to make it a matter of prayer on a regular basis. God, help me. Here's, here's the last one, friends. And then I want to give you some ways to apply this in our lives. The, the last one is this. Is our words can be inconsistent, so be consistent. He gets down to that section 9 through 12. And he just calls us out. He says, listen, how are you going to praise God one moment and then pronounce cursing on the human beings that look in his image? And, the, the, and cursing in this one, this is not cussing. It's closely related. Cussing is one thing. This cursing in the text is to pronounce uh, something evil or wrong upon someone. All right? I want you to get the, the they all, they're all cousins, but, but I want you to understand this is different than what's, what's in the text, right? He, he, what he is saying is that how can, we, how can we just be going back and forth all the time? He said it don't make sense. He says, he says in nature, you'll never see an apple tree carrying oranges. He says it, it's unnatural. It doesn't make sense. And so he's calling us away from this. He's telling us all of us will be tempted to be bilingual. Some of us have been bilingual a long time. And I'm not talking about Spanish and English. There's, there's another level of bilinguality that we can carry. And, and he's saying, he's saying that should not be so. He's saying there ought to be some consistencies. And how we communicate and how we talk and how we use our words, there should be some consistency in our lives. Let me, let me use the rest of our message to give you two lifts. 
Here's the first one. I want to give you some habits to apply when it comes to the tongue. Let me give you five ways, five ways that can help us to honor this passage in our lives. Here's the first one, truth. Somebody say truth. We, we've got to learn to speak the truth. If you and I want to use our tongues well, we have to make sure that we speak the truth. Ephesians 4, 15 says, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become respect and mature of him who is the head and the head of Christ. Speaking the truth, what's that mean? That means that we ought to speak op honestly, openly, and transparently. It means you got to be honest about your feelings, got to be honest about your actions, be honest about your mistakes. You can't just say, what's wrong, nothing. You got to be honest and say, no, this is what happened. I, I feel hurt about this, or I feel excited about this, or I feel frustrated about this, or I feel a little fearful about this. It's only in us sharing, it's only in us communicating, it's only when we share our hearts that we really can connect with people. If we, it's, it's the truth. The truth is the foundation for which we can build long-lasting relationships. Truth. Not only truth, here's the next one, being kind in our conversation. It, it really means, the other word you can put here is being positive. I, I love the way Ephesians 4, 29 puts it. He says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. I love that phrase. He says, he says our conversation should be helpful. It should be that which helps to build others up, right? He says it needs to be in such a case that we can build up others, we can strengthen others. It needs to be helpful. Phrases like, thank you. Phrases like, I appreciate you. Phrases like, are you okay? Phrases that say, hey, let, help, help me to understand. Or, or, or I forgive you, or I apologize, or, or, or what, what can I do to help? These are all, or I'm sorry. These are all phrases that are kind phrases that help us to be able to connect and love on each other. And they, they, they help us live in our faith because kindness is sourced in God because he's been so kind to us. There, there's a popular restaurant chain that, that we all know that is incredible, that is known for their kindness. Matter of fact, when you finish your order, they also often say, my pleasure. Because they just, it's something about how Chick-fil-A and kindness has been connected together that their, their customer service, it just, it always elevates the experience. And it helps you, to, because here's the thing that business people know. Business people know you can make money when you're kind to people. Because you'll get returning clients and you'll get referrals. And you'll, you, because how you treat people helps you know whether or not they'll come back or not. Friends, the same thing applies to us in our Christian lives. If we're going to reflect our faith and the God we serve well, then the words we say got to be words that reflect what Jesus would say, and it is kindness that goes so far. God, help me to be positive in my language, kind in my language. Help me to be known as an encourager of people because here's the reality. Everybody around you is walking around with a cup that needs to be filled to help remind them that God as a purpose and plan for their lives and our prayers, God ought to use you every single day. You ought to be walking around trying to find people you can uplift and encourage because that's what God does for you. Here's another, here's another way you and I got to use our words, respectful. Everyone that, that we meet is made in the image of God. That we never have a right to look down on somebody because of their background or, or, or what their possessions or, or anything. No, we, as we said a couple of Sundays ago, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Not one of us is better than somebody else. We all carry dignity and value. Whether someone is homeless on the street or the CEO of a company, we all are equal in the eyes of God. We all carry value, so we got to talk to people with respect. We got to treat people and speak to them with respect. We got to see that person with genuine care and concern and empathy. And we got to imagine ourselves in their position. That's the only way we really can talk to people and honor people and speak to people in the appropriate way. Here's another one listening, listening, listening. I, I love James chapter 1, verse 19, where James says this My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to be angry. Notice the order with which he puts that in. He says, first of all, be quick to listen. 
We live in a world where it's hard sometimes to find somebody that will listen to us. It's hard sometimes to find somebody that will look us in the eye, puts down the phone, stops texting, stops watching TV, and just looks at us and hears our heart and hears us really. Not rolling their eyes, not making faces, but listen, not thinking about what I'm going to say to retaliate against you, but hearing you are. Listen, one of the best things you can do to improve your relationships, to build better relationships, is to learn how to be a good listener and to lean in and hear people. That's exactly what James said. He says, be quick to listen. Sometimes it's our listening that influences the whole relationship because we didn't hear that person in the first place. And here's the last tool you need in your toolbox, silence. Somebody say silence. Oh, that's a good tool to keep in your toolbox, your, your word toolbox. When the text says you ought to be, James 1.19, he says, be slow to speak. <laughs> uh, Proverbs 10.19 says, sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. Oh, man, sometimes you just got to stop talking so much. Sometimes we've got to stop talking to the wrong people. <laughs> sometimes we've got to say, Lord, give me some discernment. Give me some discretion because I don't want to go too far. Give me the right people to talk to. Help me to know when enough is enough. We've all been there, have we not? Where we just, it was just one sentence too much. It, we've all been there and we said, oh, if I could have just held that back. Sometimes the greatest tool that we have is to not say nothing at all. Just keep on moving, keep on walking. How you doing? And keep on making your move be, because sometimes silence can be a, a, be a tool that God wants us to use in wisdom. All right, friends, let me, let me close by giving you the habits to avoid. I gave you five habits that you can utilize to be able to leverage, to be able to impact others. Those are the five tools that we want to use every single day. Every single day, we ought to be leveraging, talking to people with respect, speaking the truth, uh, speaking positive, finding not to say too much. But then there are five ways, too, that we want to avoid. Here's the first one. You knew this was coming. Number one is lying. <laughs> All of us have had that moment, right, where we... The pressure was there or whatever the case may be. But, but lying is, is happened so much that we live in a world that's always faking everything. People lie on their resumes, lie on their taxes, lie on their jobs, lie about their time, lie on their expense reports. People lie with fake boyfriends and fake girlfriends. I mean, people lie at work, lie at home, lie at church. People lie all the time. And he's saying to us that lying doesn't fit who we are. He's saying that lying is any time you try to intentionally mislead somebody. Sometimes we lie so much we end up lying about the lie because we can't remember what we told the first time. They did, they did a study and they found out that, that by age four, 90% of children have already figured out the concept of lying. And then it follows us from day to day. That, that it said, one study said that 60% of adults uh, can't have a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. Now, that other, that other study said that men lie six times a day and women lie three times. I don't know if that's right. I don't agree. I disagree. I, I should have skipped over that one. That, that same. That, that, that somebody said, I knew, I knew it. Somebody, uh, they said the number one lie told was, nothing's wrong, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so all of us have to figure out how we can speak the truth. We got to speak the truth and live in the truth. So many times we lie to try to protect our image, protect who we are, protect how people view us. But the truth of the matter is that we're going to connect better with people when they know who we really are. When they know that we are human, that we make mistakes, that we have challenges, that we have issues, because sin loves to live in dark places. And even if we can't tell the truth to a certain person, find somebody we can confide in, we can talk to, we can be accountable for. But if we're going to be the men and women God has called us to be, we got to avoid lying at all costs. Here's the next one, not only lying, but anger and bitterness. Anger and bitterness. Ephesians 4, 31 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Whenever you and I resort to anger and bitterness, we really are in a dangerous place. Unfortunately, we live in a world where it's modeled in every place. 
all of these crazy reality TV shows and all the other stuff that we see, the culture more and more is moving to a place where there is anger and name calling and fussing and fighting like this is going to solve our problems. But many of us in the room know this doesn't make our problems better. It often makes our problems worse. If you always on the 10, it can't be everybody else. If you always coming in hot, it can't be the whole, it can't be the, everybody in the world. There's got to be something else that's happening on a deeper, deeper basis that you're going to have to work on because God doesn't want you angry at the entire world. God doesn't want you using anger to try to solve all your problems. Sometimes it creates more problems. We get in legal issues and other things. We lose our jobs. We lose relationships because nobody wants to be around a person that always is lashing out or that's how they solve their problems. Instead, as a follower of Christ, he's calling us to learn how to deal with these, to, to sometimes take a time out, regroup ourselves before we know things are going too far, to sometimes wait until we calm down before we decide to have that conversation, to sometimes need to get counseling, to try to figure out what's happening in my life, that sometimes maybe there's our, our unforgiveness or grudges that continue to eat away at me that are keeping me from being who God has called me to be. Here, here's another tool that you need to keep in your toolbox. It is criticism and gossip. Criticism and gossip. Boy, uh, uh, some people have the gift of, uh, of, of criticism. They just, they, just, they just seem to find the negative in any situation. For whatever reason, they can, you can be, it, everything can be perfect, but they have, a, they have the gift of coming in the room and, and deflating the whole room, or as some would say, killing the whole vibe in the room. Because whatever reason, they just keep finding negativity. They just keep nitpicking and, and picking on everything. It's, it's her birthday, and yet you got to criticize her outfit. You got you, you to gotta bring the attention to you. You got you to gotta reset the room. God, this is not of God. God never, never gave this spirit. Matter of fact, Philippians 4 and 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, praiseworthy, think about those things. This criticism, you gotta, we got to stop being the one that just criticizes. It's, it's okay with holding people accountable, that's one thing. But being critical is to constantly demean and discourage somebody else, to beat them down. We all know what that's like because some of us have lived and faced those situations and nothing good from that. The cousin to criticism is gossip. Where you always think you got to spill the tea, you always think, I, listen, you don't know, but guess what I heard? You, you always feel like you're in the know. You always, you got your own personal shade room account. You just, you just want to share and, 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 and promote. You, you, you want to you wanna be the one, right? But here's what we got to realize. Every dog that brings a bone will carry a bone. Every, the same person gossiping about somebody else, they will also gossip about you. We don't want to be that person that doesn't fit who we are. Two more friends and I'm done. When we talk to people, we got to make sure we get rid of the habit of disrespect. When we disrespect people with our tone or our demeanor or our attitude or our words, then we put that person into a corner. And what we give out is exactly what we go get. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you said, listen, I was doing good till they came at me the way they came at me. And if that's what you want, then that's what you're going to get, right? I mean, it, it is what it is. Like, if you're going to come at me that way, listen, I, I, I tried. I, I tried to hold my tongue, but you, you said one too many things. Disrespect always brings the worst out of people. It doesn't make a difference. All of us have this intrinsic value that God has put in us, and it brings something out. Matter of fact, it ain't even, they only have to be disrespectful to you. You can just watch them be disrespectful to somebody else, and you go jump in and solve it for them because that, that's just how you roll. You're like, listen, I can't take it. I can't take no kid talking to their mama crazy, talking to their teacher crazy. You're like, listen, I can't take it. I can't. That's why you're not teaching school because you, your fuse is just not where it needs to be. You... You'd be locked up somewhere trying to hold a kid up. Boy, I told you. So you're not ready. But, but disrespect, right, it, 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 it brings something out of us. And so you and I have to understand that we can't disrespect people. We can't do it because when we do it, ultimately, it, it's, it's always going to set the wrong stage. Here's the last tool that we got to avoid using. It's the tool of silence. I know silence was on both lists. But this is the silence that means the silent treatment. It's when we take silence and we weaponize it to hurt somebody. 
It's when we take silence and we use it to ignore a person or we use it to, to punish a person or to hurt a person. It's, it's when we go silent either on certain relationships or even in a marriage context or even in a friendship context. Yes, yeah, sometimes you need to be silent, but other times we weaponize it to use it to hurt somebody. It's, it's when you're in a married relationship and you start playing the silent game. And you start playing it for one day after another day. My wife and I struggled with this when we were early in our marriage. And you know what's crazy about playing the silent game is that you can, you can play it so well that you can be silent and icing the other person. And then the phone rings, hey, how you doing? You doing good? Yeah, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And then you ice them all over again like they're not even in the room. It's, it's crazy that you be, can become so petty that you can, you can find ways to try to push certain buttons. You can find way to try to poke at them. You can find way to try to, in, to, to try and intimidate them. This is a dangerous game. Nobody wins in this. Nobody wins. And I'm not talking about relationships where somebody has hurt you and you've decided to cut some boundaries in place to protect you. That's a whole different thing because sometimes you do need boundaries in your life with certain relationships when that relationship is toxic or when that relationship is not headed in the right direction. This is different. This is when you being silent and being petty just so you can be petty and get back at the other person. Friends, I, I wanted to give you a game plan. I didn't want to cover James 12, James 3, without giving you a game plan today of these five ways, five habits you want to cultivate in your life and five habits to avoid that if we do these, we can honor God well in our lives. A, a, a poet once wrote these words, a careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and steal. A brutal word may smite and kill. But a gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. And a loving word may heal and bless. Friends, you and I must know there is power in the words that we use. And you and I must choose to use that power power responsibly, that God wants to heal you, God wants to guide you, God wants to take your relationships to a whole new place, your career, your walk with him, your family, your, your friendships, but it all starts with our words, and your words set the course. I, I, I close by telling you our, our, our children at one point had a chance to attend this camp. And at the end of the camp, uh, they had this thing called affirmations. And at the end of the camp, I, I remember our, our daughter was there, and they called her forward, her, her counselor for the week, and, and began to walk her through some affirmations that they said they saw in her. And here, the, 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 the counselor said, I see in you aspiring, that you have goals and you have dreams, and I've seen the way that you aspire others. I see in you joyfulness. There's a joy in you that can't be quenched. Every morning when I watched you get up, as I watched you interact with other team cabin mates, you always had a joy in you. And then she said, you have an authenticity, that there was an authenticity about you, that there was something about you that is authentic and real and and genuine and valuable. And I sat there and watched as that young lady called those values out of the life of our daughter. And I thought to myself, wow, you saw all that in one week. <laughs> it, it, you saw, and I was blown away at how powerful it was for her to call out of our daughter what we also saw in her. But I thought to myself, what would happen if every day you had somebody in your life that was calling out of you what God had already put in you? What what would happen if you had a family member or a friend or a co-worker that was calling out of you and celebrating you and affirming you for the uniqueness that God is doing in us? So many times we hold back instead of sharing with other people and using our words to build people up. It's easy to see what's wrong, but sometimes God has said, I want you to see what's right. See what's happening right. See what's happening positive. See the progress and celebrate what God is doing even now for what he's going to do later. Friends, I want to invite you to join for just a moment right now. I want to give you a, an opportunity to do just what we've talked about in today's sermon. If you've got your phone nearby, I want to invite you right now 
to text a message of encouragement and to use your words to at least two people. Just, just grab your phone if you can. I want you to text encouragement to two people. Or maybe it's something that you need to say, listen, I just want to apologize for something. I'm going to talk to you more later. But I was thinking about you in today's sermon. And I just wanted to, to, to text you. If you'll do that, I want you to text at least two people and just use your words right now to call out of what God is doing, to affirm what God is doing. Or maybe it's a correction. It's saying, man, you know, I, I missed the mark. I shouldn't have said that. I, 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 I lied about something. I need to correct something. My tone was off. But I want you to give you right now a couple of moments. Would you text two people in your life, in your relationships, maybe a church member, maybe a family member, uh, maybe a coworker? But I want you to do that right now. Do that right now. And then once you've sent those two messages, I just want you to take a couple moments of prayer and say, Lord, I just want to help me to use my words in a way that brings you glory and honor. Guide my tongue. Guide my heart. Use me, Lord, so 